right, and hello everyone. I'm Joan Alacqua. I'm Executive Director of the History Project. And it's my pleasure to welcome you here tonight to our uh, Zoom event about Outright. Uh, before I introduce Outright, I'd like to tell you a little bit more about the History Project. We are Boston's LGBTQ community archives. Uh, we document, preserve, and share the LGBTQ history of Boston, Massachusetts, and New England regionally. Um, we are a volunteer-driven nonprofit that has been doing this work since 1980, and I encourage you to check us out at historyproject.org. Um, thank you to those who have already made a donation to support our work. If you are uh, able, I'm going to put the donate link in the chat. Anything helps us to continue this work. Uh, and I would like to thank the um, Massachusetts Humanities uh, Bridge Street Fund for uh, helping us to put on this event this evening. So tonight we're talking about Outright. Uh, running from 1990 to 1999, the annual Outright Conference played a pivotal role in shaping LGBTQ literary culture in the United States and its emerging canon. Tonight we're celebrating Outright, the speeches that shaped LGBTQ literary culture edited by Julie R. Ensner and Elena Gross. And we also have for tonight's panel, Nancy Barriano, Cheryl Clark, and Michael Bronski. Uh, <laughs> Julie is the author of four poetry collections, including Avowed and the editor of the complete works of Pat Parker and Sister Love, The Letters of Audre Lorde and Pat Parker in 1974 to 1989. Ensner edits and publishes Sinister Wisdom, a multicultural lesbian literary and art journal, and she lives in Central Florida. Elena Gross is an independent writer, curator, and cultural critic living in Oakland, California. Her research specializes in conceptual and material abstractions of the body and representations of identity in fine art, photography, and popular media. So with that, Elena, I'm going to turn the floor over to you. Oh, I should mention first, sorry, everyone. Like I said, end of Pride Month, my mind is somewhere three weeks ago. Um, if you have questions, we'll have time at the end for, for Q&A. Uh, but if you have questions or comments in the meantime, please feel free to use the chat. When we do get to the Q&A, we'll do the hand raise function. Um, and I'll remind everyone of that when we get to that point. Now, Elena, your turn. Thank you, Joan, and thank you everyone for um, for joining us this evening for um, for what is sure to be a very special program. Um, as Joan mentioned, I'm Elena Gross. Um, I'm one of the co-editors, along with Julie Enzer, of Outright, the speeches that shaped LGBTQ literary culture. I'm going to start first um, by reading from uh, just the first uh, couple paragraphs from the introduction of the book to give, I'm certain most of you are as familiar, if not more so, um, than I am even with uh, with outright conferences, but just to give a little context for those of you who may be unfamiliar with what they were. Between 1990 and 1999, eight national outright conferences convened first in San Francisco, then in Boston. Initially, Outlook, the, the glossy national gay and lesbian magazine that published from 1988 until 1992, organized these gatherings of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer writers, editors, readers, and activists. Then when Outlook ceased, activists from the Bromfie Bromfield Street Educational Foundation, better known for its leftist journal, Gay Community News, organized Outright. Outright played a crucial role in defining, expanding, and amplifying LGBTQ literary culture by bringing together many important LGBTQ writers of the 1990s in raucous events, highlighted by keynote addresses, plenary sessions and workshops, coupled with late nights of drinking, dancing, hookups, and other forms of literary revelry. The outright conferences helped define a new queer literary canon and a movement of queer literary production. The speeches, arguments, and ideas from these conferences shaped and continue to shape indelibly the work of LGBTQ writers, and this history provides a touchstone for contemporary LGBTQ writers and activists imagining what the future might hold for our creative, literary, and artistic work. The first outright conference was at San Francisco's Cathedral Hill Hotel on March 3rd and 4th, 1990, less than five months after the 1989 earthquake. Originally, Outright was a project of Outlook magazine, founded by Jeffrey Escoffier, Kim Klausner, Peter Babcock, Michael Sexton, and Deborah Chasnoff. Outlook was a co-gender publishing project with a commitment to racial diversity. 
Outlook editors and activists wanted to bring ideas about LGBTQ life into broader public discussions. And next I will um, introduce our panel of speakers. Um, so I will start first with Nancy Barriano. Nancy K. Barriano is the former editor and publisher of the groundbreaking award-winning lesbian and feminist press, Firebrand Books. During its 15 year existence, 1985 to 2000, Firebrand published many significant authors, including Dorothy Allison, Allison Bechtel, Cheryl Clark, Leslie Feinberg, Jewel Gomez, Judith Katz, Audre Lorde, and Minnie Bruce Pratt. Welcome, Nancy. Hi. Next, um, we have Cheryl Clark. Cheryl Clark is still a Black lesbian feminist poet. She is <laughs> author of the collections, Narratives, Poems, and the Tradition of Black Women, Living as a Lesbian, Humid Pitch, Experimental Love, and By My Precise Haircut. Clark's iconic essays are included in This Bridge Called My Back, Writings by Radical Women of Color, and Homegirls, a Black feminist anthology. Clark retired from Rutgers University in 2013 after 41 years of service. With Barbara J. Ballier, her partner, she co-owns Blenheim Hill Books in Hobart, New York, the Book Village of the Catskills, and co-organizes the annual Hobart Festival of Women Writers. Welcome, Cheryl. Thank you. Good evening. And next uh, is Michael Bronski. Michael Bronski is a professor of the practice at, of the practice at Harvard University. He served as program coordinator for six outright conferences in the 1990s. Uh, sorry, excuse me, Michael Bronski is professor of the practice in media and activism in studies of women, gender, and sexuality. He's been involved with LGBT politics since 1969 as an activist, organizer, writer, publisher, editor, and independent scholar. His latest book, A Queer History of the United States for Young People, was published in the summer of 2019, and A Queer History of the United States, it published in 2011, was awarded that. Israel Fishman Nonfiction Award for Best LGBT Book of 2010 by the American Library Association, as well as the Landa Literary Award for the Best Nonfiction Book of 2012. Since 1970, Bronski has written extensively on culture, politics, film, theater, books, sexuality, LGBT culture, and current events in publications such as The Village Voice, Synapse, The Los, Ang the Los Angeles Times, The Boston Globe, The San Francisco Chronicle, and many other very notable publications. Uh, Michael is a very um, accomplished and um, generous and thoughtful, uh, thoughtful writer and activist. And it's a pleasure to be um, sharing space with you this evening. Welcome, Michael. Thank you. Thank you. I always feel so tired after people read all those things. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, and we, you have to save your strength for this for this evening. So, um, <laughs> So um, next we are going to move into um, each of our esteemed panelists are gonna read um, brief um, excerpts from the book uh, outright. Um, and then we'll follow that up with a, a conversation amongst the panelists as well as audience Q&A. Um, so if I can next have uh, uh, Nancy Bariano, please, if you wouldn't mind sharing with us your excerpt. Okay, I think this is six minutes I tried. Um, it, it's, uh, First of all, I have to say that I had 48 hours notice to be the keynote speaker at the 1998 convention because Pratiba Pramora's mom um, became very ill or was very ill. And so she wasn't able to come from London. And as I told my fellow panelists before we began, after I said yes, because who wouldn't say yes? And besides, I had been thinking about a lot of this stuff for a while, but after I said yes, the first thing that I did was turn to my partner at the time, Elizabeth Nonis, and say, oh my God, what am I gonna wear? Mm -hmm. So I have, I have sort of fulfilled my femme credentials in that way, and then here we go. Um, you can't control what people think about what you've written, whether they misunderstand your intent, whether they attribute motivations to it that you never dreamed of, whether they have a grudge against you and it comes out in the reviews that are done, whether people think it's the definitive book on the subject and gets adopted for classroom use. You can't control that. You can influence some of that, but you can't control it. 
Art made public becomes public property as far as the uses to which it is put. Publishers, when we function both effectively and with good intent, try to give a book the best life it can have out there and therefore are always, I think, partners in the process of making words real on the page and then multiplying them outside of one's journal or laptop computer, putting them out into the marketplace. The commercial world is not static. And I think that I was the only publisher who ever keynoted an outright, um, which is interesting. Um, <laughs> The commercial world is not static. The rules that govern it, the economic and political forces in which the writing gets launched into the world change. We are living in a time now, that this is 1998, that is marketably different from the publishing world that existed, let us say, five years ago. I actually would say that if I had to put a month on the demarcation when it became noticeable to publishers that the world had changed, it would be July 1996. Two years ago this July, it was noticeable. Publishers large and small were accustomed to receiving 25 to 30% returns, even of books that had already been sold right back into their warehouses. Many of those books were damaged and therefore not saleable. Many of those books had already been counted on the ledger sheets and royalties paid to the authors. Bookstores have up to two years to return books. No other industry in this country allows that but conventional returns practice for booksellers is up to two years. Publishers had learned how to factor those return percentages into their business models. Only blockbusters, where volume sales make the difference, were above the fray. Profit on each item is very marginal. You must do volume in order to make money. And Firebrand would like to thank Alison Bechtel and Leslie Feinberg for doing volume. Um, in July 1996, return shot up to 50 to 65% across the board. Um, university presses, small presses, trade houses weren't any different. How various institutions deal with that reality depends on how much money they have. Obviously, the less capitalized you are, the less money you have to absorb unusual and unexpected expenses. That's the easiest way of saying it, right? If you have a small bank account and you have an emergency repair to your car, you are in better shape than if you have no bank account and your car does the same bad thing. You are even better off if you have a big bank account and you can buy a new car. It's the same principle regardless of the product. So the publishing world has changed and the publishing world has changed for many different reasons that people much smarter than I am economically have written about. They've written about it in The Nation, in The New York Times, in The Wall Street Journal, in The Lambda Book Report, in The Feminist Bookstore News. They have written about it in a variety of places that intelligent readers can get their hands on, especially intelligent readers who are also writers. Most writers don't want to know about it. I sent a package of materials from all of these different places to my authors with their royalty statements. It wasn't about firebrand, it was about life, right? I said, if you want to talk to me about this, just give me a call and I'll see what I can do to explain it better. But they didn't call. They're not publishers, they're writers. They don't want to know about it because it is very upsetting. When you're struggling as a writer and nobody is supporting you financially and there isn't a lot of money in writing, then to be told it's only going to get worse, well, you can imagine. But in a homophobic world where they do not like us to begin with, these practices are destroying the ability to sell gay and lesbian books in the trade world. And I would say this is the year before the last outright. I know of one agent who has said, quote, I'm not coming to this conference because I cannot tell people that I won't take them on without even reading their material, because I know that I can no longer sell the stuff that three years ago I was selling. So I just won't come to the conference. So many of us here came out of a movement, out of several movements. I could not be queer without a movement. I am not somebody who knew 
ever since I was 16 years old, and now if I were doing this, I would say 12 years old or nine years old when children are identifying themselves so much earlier in their lives. I came out when I was 38 years old. I wouldn't have even known that it was a possibility for me were there not a visible feminist and lesbian movement. Many of us would not have known. Many of us, if we honestly we look at our lives, can point to those political movements, Black, feminist, queer, can point to those movements and understand how we have been able to make our lives. We each of us bigger, get bigger and richer, fuller, larger, more complex, complex than we would have been able to had those movements not existed. Movements that we help make and movements where we joined that other people had already done a lot of the work. It is not a given. It is not a given, and history will show us over and over again if we take the time to look that if we do not nurture those movements, if we do not see ourselves in a movement, if we do not do the things that help keep movements alive, which is more than having only a conference once a year, if we do not, we will not be, not individually in our lives, but we will not be as some kind of peoplehood that sees our possibilities ever expanding. How do we keep our queer souls? We must make common cause with people who are more on our side than less on our side, even if they are not just like us. Mm. Thanks so much. Um, next, we're going to have Cheryl Clark. <laughs> Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here tonight. And hello to everyone else who's here. And Nancy, I'd like to say it is not only films who think about <laughs> what their outfits. Good, Cheryl. Makes me feel really good. I appreciate that. And so does my butch honey, so. Is she really butch? <laughs> we'll talk about it, Sharon, we'll talk. About okay. It. I'm, <laughs> hello, Michael. Uh, hi, Cheryl. How, <laughs> How are you? Hello, everyone else. Um, I'm going to read from Dorothy Allison's keynote uh, entitled Survival is the Least of My Dreams, delivered March 20, 1992. I was asked to speak about survival. The difficulty for me is that survival is the least of my desires. What I do know is that we must aim much higher than just staying alive if we are to begin to approach our true potential. Let me be clear how much has changed in the short span of my life. Although there are few people who think of themselves as revolutionaries anymore, the world has been remade. Look around you. Apartheid is being dismantled and Nelson Mandela walks the streets of South Africa. Until a few years ago, I could not imagine that happening. The world is no less dangerous and people are still dying for their origins, beliefs, color, and sexuality. But I find myself full of startled awe and hope. I have lived my life in pursuit of the remade world. When I was 24, I read everything written by lesbians. And when I was 24, it was still possible. I rarely dealt with men, rarely 
contacted my family, was strictly non-monogamous, wrote bad poetry when I was too tired to sleep, and taught myself laboriously to write fiction in short snatches of time stolen from my job. When I think about the generation of writers that Edward Albee, who spoke at the second outright conference in San Francisco in 1991, I become more determined to remake the world. I work to make it possible for young queer writers not to have to waste so much of themselves fighting off hatred and dismissal of an ignorant majority. But to make any contribution to other lives, I know that I must first begin in the carefully examined specifics of my own. I must acknowledge who has helped me survive and how my own hopes have been shaped. I must acknowledge the miracles in my life. It was a miracle that I discovered feminism and found that I did not have to be ashamed of who I was. Feminism gave me the possibility of understanding my place in the world and I claim it as a title and an entitlement. I need you to do more than survive. As writers, as revolutionaries, tell the truth, your truth, in your own way. Do not buy into their systems of censorship, imagining that if you drop this character or hide that emotion, you can slide through their blockades. Do not eat your own heart out in the hope of pleasing them. The only hope you have, the only hope any of us has is the remade life. I want hard stories. I demand them from myself. I demand them from my students and friends and colleagues. Hard stories are worth the difficulty. It seems to me the only way I have forgiven anything, understood anything, is through that process of opening up to my own terror and pain and re-examining it, recreating it in the story and making it something different, making it meaningful, even if the meaning is only in the act of telling. How can I write mean stories. I don't have that child's easy hope for better times that fueled so much of my early stories. I have fallen in love with the hard side, with the women and men made tough by life and loss, who nonetheless have never lost their determined love for their own kind. If I am not mean enough to honor them, then I have no right to the stories. I need you to write mean stories. I need you to honor our dead, to help them survive. More than 10 years ago, I wrote a poem about a lesbian who died in Boston a death I read about in the paper and knew immediately could have been my own. The death of a woman who, quote, 
might not have been known as a lesbian, unquote, but who, as I've read her poem in public, I learned more and more about her until I was certain that not only her death, but her life could have been my own. And that very likely she too would have wanted the mean story her life told. I made a mean piece of hope out of telling about her because I believe that if I died that death, someone would sing my song, recount my story. More and more of what I write now, I write in homage to those we have lost, to do more than survive. That is what we need, what I need from you. I need you to tell the truth, to tell the mean stories, and to sing the song of hope. Thank you so much, Cheryl. You're welcome. Um, next, we're going to have a reading from Michael Bronski. Hi, thank you. And I just, since we're discussing what we're wearing here, I just want to say I'm, I'm famous for actually dressing down and looking horrible, but I put on a clean shirt tonight to do this. Oh, Michael. <laughs> it's you look clean. wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> Beautiful, Michael. So I am going to read um, sort of briefly from Tony Kushner's speech on pretentiousness. I'm going to read briefly because Tony's sentences are so uh, pretentious and grandiose. I actually have a hard time reading them out loud, so I'll, I'll get through as much as I can, but it's going to be a short, relatively short reading. <clears throat> On pretentiousness, the <laughs> keynote address for March 3rd, 1995. Also, keep in mind that Tony had been invited the year before, but could not make it at the last minute because they were doing rewrites of Angels in America on, on Broadway. So this was his, this was the year later. When he couldn't make it, John Preston was the keynote. <clears throat> Pretentiousness, overstatement, rhetoric, histrionics, grandiosity, and portentiousness are, as much as they are tropes of fascists and demagogues everywhere, American tropes, gestures of habitual florid overstep common among the practitioners of American culture to whom I have always been most instantly attracted. It is an aspect of American history and the culture we have developed that I am keen to possess, to transform for my own purposes, the writing of declarations, constitutions, epics, manifestos. Consider chapter 18 of de Tocqueville's Democracy in America, which is entitled, Why American Writers and Speakers Are Often Bombastic, which is remarkable for its insight. And then he quotes briefly, I have often noticed that Americans whose language when talking business is clear and dry without the slightest ornamentation and of such extreme simplicity as often to be vulgar, easily turn to bombastic when they attempt a poetic style, that they are pompous without stopping from beginning to end of speech, and one would have to suppose seeing them thus prodigal, thus prodigal of metaphors that they could never say anything simply. When I began work on Angels in America, I feel that ostent I felt that the ostentatiousness of this project I was attempting, offering itself like a fatted calf to critics who love to feast on pretentiousness and grandiosity. I felt the same self-same pretentiousness and grandiosity was my birthright as an American. And rather than pointing to some serious deficiencies and flaws in my characters, although such deficiencies and flaws undoubtedly exist and are complicit in all of this. My artistic obstreperousness indicted me, uh, indicated to me on good days that I was heir, no matter how puny an heir I might be, to a literary tradition that had produced some of my favorite books. Chief among them was, and still is, Moby Dick. We know, <laughs> we know de Tocqueville never met Melville, but he might have been describing him in advance. I have often, 
I have always loved the, da the, the daring, the absurdity, the frequently hair-raising success and occasional hair-raising failures, the passion and the onrushing grand grandeloquency, grand, grand, I can't even say it, uh, devouring recklessness of Melville's writers. It gives me license to try anything. Melville's first test of critical disregard came with his book, uh, Marathi, which is, in my opinion, one of his greatest, clearly a warm up for Moby Dick, which also failed critically. Pretentiousness is risky, a vast, a, a vast amorphous self generating anxiety comes with the equally vast and amorphous territory one has chosen to cover. One is highly susceptible to ridicule and possessed of such a number of flanks that it is impossible to protect them all. Since the size of one's ambition is laid bare for the world to see, being thin-skinned is a predictable consequence and symptom of pretentiousness. One's skin is, after all, so painfully stretched over such a large area. Implicit in grandiosity and pretentiousness is the unslackable desire to embrace everyone. The impulse to make work that contains the world surely stems from an infantile impulse to swallow it whole and to be universally adored for having done so. These desires are even more doomed than the desires you develop as an adult and to carry the appetite of the infant into middle age is to risk a certain, a certain indignity to, to say the least the way, for instance, that this speech attempts to be self, to be simultaneously a self-defense and a self-critique, um, we we pretentious writers of the left share this unfortunate flaw of being excessively thin-skinned and rapaciously greedy with other with other control freaks. We'd probably avoided any association with Rush Limbaugh, Bob Dole, Adolf Hitler. Pretentious as is, we could add more names to that that are more contemporary. <laughs> it is, I sometimes think, a form of hysteria that manifests itself in listing, cataloging, manifests itself in a, a panic, strained effort toward the encyclopedic, at least the important ideas which the pretentious writer doesn't feel she or he truly or deeply comprehends escape, while rightly attentions dazedly malinger over some, some of, less of less consequence. I suppose I'm speaking here of a tradition of public art that seriously and that consciously engages itself with civic debate, a tradition of writing that presumptuously aspires to the position to, to position itself among other grand American texts, each of which is not without overreach. The Declaration of Independence is pretentious, so is the Constitution. So I'm going to stop there because I'm actually getting caught up in Tony's words, but I urge everybody to read the speech in the book. Thanks so much, Michael. Thank you. Um, lastly, we'll have uh, Julie Enzer. Uh, great. I'm going to read a brief passage from Christos's speech. Um, before I read, I do want to invoke, we've had a number of losses this year of people who were either directly involved in outright or who I think carried on the work of the conference. And so I wanna mention four names briefly. Um, the first is one of the founders of Outlook Magazine and the, um, one of the key people who organized the initial outright conferences, Jeffrey Escoffier. Um, he passed away in May of this year. There's an incredible obituary about him in Jacobin by, Witt, by the historian Witt Strub. And of course, more recently, there was a New York Times obituary as well. Earlier this year, we lost the um, indefatigable Richard Labonte, um, who was both a bookseller, was at a number of outrights. Um, we, I communicated with him originally about this um, book and um, he was very excited about it. And he just did so much for LGBT letters. Um, at the end of last year, the um, poet and writer and just general man about town in the San Francisco Bay Area, Blackberry, passed away. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a beautiful picture of him at Outright that's part of the uh, Bay Area Reporter in a recent issue. If you don't know Blackberry, 
Um, he was really a wonderful, um, loving person and a huge presence. Um, and then finally, most recently in the past couple of days, the Australian lesbian mystery writer, Claire McNabb died. Um, oh. And I do not know if Claire was at Outright, um, but she was a Nyad author. Uh, Barbara Greer was at, I believe, at many of the Outrights, if not all. Um, and so I wanted to mention Claire's passing. I'm going to read just a couple of paragraphs from Christos's speech called The Gift of Open Sky. Um, and I selected them because they do two pieces of work that I think are really important about this period. In the first paragraph, she really brings to the audience theory and analysis. And um, that's such important work that writers do. Um, and so you'll see what I mean when I talk about that. And in the second paragraph, she talks about uh, she's doing a little community organizing right there in the conference, uh, which is also wonderful. And then it concludes with a poem by her. So this is Christos from The Gift of Open Sky. Another phrase that is a tool of oppressors is ethnic cleansing. I could not believe it when I first heard that phrase roll out of a newscaster's mouth. I posit to you that there's no such thing as a clean murder. These phrases are con artists whose job is to convince us to accept injustice. As long as we butcher language ourselves, such as using the word blind to mean ignorance or insensitivity, we are cooperating with our oppressors. When we hold events in inaccessible places or charge rates that could buy a bag of groceries, we imitate the very people whose aim it is to eliminate us. What people of color, the aged, the imprisoned, those with disabilities share with us as queers is our outsider status. When we fight only to have our private privilege, when we are abusing our comrades and denying our sacred roles as healers, these issues that I am naming are often dismissed as tiresome. I challenge you to think about what it means when equality and mutual respect are considered boring. Mm. One of my particular jobs is to spread the word about Norma Jean Croy, a native lesbian who remains incarcerated though her brother has been freed on the grounds of self-defense in the same incident. This is a reflection of the fact that the prison business is blatantly sexist and racist, routinely forcing women and people of color to serve double and triple time compared to white males. I have petitions and a donation can to which I would appreciate your attention. Lest you think I am abusing the privilege of the speech by speaking of Norma Jean Croy, I'd like to remind you that she will not be on the six o'clock news or discussed in the New York Times and so far has not been embraced by the media. Because she is invisible, because I have not done hard time, I need to bring her into our circle tonight. Um, and we note in a footnote that Norma Jean Croy was released on May 20th of 2005 after serving 19 years in prison. Oh God. So the final poem that Christos ended with is called, Before Me the Land and Water Open. Their arms, tender sisters who have kept my place, watched each spray of racing birds, woven them into the still air for me to catch a shimmering glint. The blousy pine grows tall as the distant mountains we call home. Mischief of the eyes is sweet. Silver slate, the sound ruffles my hair. Roots I packed for years settle in this meadow, delicate with brambles broom, bright yellow suns I call beach daisies. These are the variations of green and gold I keep deep within my hands. These never same astounding clouds drift through my eyes in bleached conversations with strangers. These are the leaves and berries who marry me in delight. Mm. This is the earth I carry in a corn husk pouch against the brutal light of clapping hands. Here is the path choked with driftwood I trace to watch the sun go down 
over mountains whose wildflowers have caught and pressed my heart. Fly through these words sharp as a deep blue and rust swallow. That wavering branch is waiting for you. Beautiful. Really nice. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful reading. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, Julie, do we do you want to take it from here to the conversation? Sure. Um, thank you, everyone, and for coming tonight. Thank you to the History Project. We, we want to have a little conversation with um, uh, among us as panelists, and I invite folks um, to put questions into the chat or to raise your hand if you want to join in the conversation. My hunch is that some of you may have been at Outright um, and have either questions or brief memories to share. Um, so I want to start by asking our panelists um, if you might give, tell us some particularly favorite memory you have that maybe doesn't come up in the book, but that gives us some of the texture of what these conferences were like. I think it's especially meaningful as we're still coming out of the pandemic and starved for the delicious stories of human connection. <laughs> Cheryl, Nancy, Michael, do you have a do you have a good and, and do you have a good story to share or shall I shall I go into the well of Sarah Schulman's stories? <laughs> I have a story. I don't know. I don't remember which outright conference it was. I think it was 1995 or 96. And uh, I remember going into, you know, the registration table and seeing Irvashi helping out, you know, going through boxes and stuff. And I said, oh, Irv. Are you and Kate still together? You know, it's not that I said it softly. I said it all loud, all over. And she just looked at me and said, yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? And she said, whatever, how many years? I don't know what it was, but you know, that was, that was a, a memorable occasion. That's not what you wanted to hear. No, that's right perfect. Those are exact. Those are those are great stories. And uh, Jeffrey Donahoe has, has just written into the chat. Of course, Irv Irvishi, what a loss piece. Yes, what a loss. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Nancy? Michael or Nancy? Did I understand Nancy to say? Oh, wait, I have to finish reading that. Mm. Or Mev, you can say it. That the people were not buying LGBTQ books at the end of the 1990s, and that's why she wasn't agreeing to take them on. Yes. You well, did, you did. The, that the, the, the agent that I had spoke, that I quoted, did say that to me. And, you know, it's not about, okay, first of all, I come from a small press perspective. So that was never the business model for most authors. They wanted a trade house that was going to do wonderful things for them and print many copies and do lots of publicity and get their name known. Um, and in, in many ways, small presses were able to do more for their authors because their authors were very important to them. Right. Not because they were the most lovely, wonderful people who ever lived in the world, but because in terms of the economics, those were the authors that made the press that made the press possible. And so the reason that I gave what was a very um, depressing in many ways, depressing for me, but not having been articulated in the small press or the larger press world, the speech that I did 
was because the world as we had known it as small press people, I started in 85, started Firebrand in 85, this was 98, okay? The world as we had known it was coming to an end um, because of business policies that had major impacts on LGBT publishing, but were not specifically directed against LGBT books in terms of being, um, you know, evil and awful and should, shouldn't exist. It wasn't those kinds of things. It was business practices. Right. And we took a big burden, small presses especially, took a big, big share of that load. Just like I have heard from, I'm not active in the publishing world, but I have publishing world friends who chat about stuff occasionally. And so now I'm told if you write a lesbian book, there's a very small chance that you will get it published, okay? If you write a trans book, there's a very good chance that you will get it published in terms of the commercial effectiveness mm -hmm. of who sort of is dominating the cultural world. So I'm not mm -hmm. talking about literary quality one way or the right, other. Right. It's, that's interesting because as, as having been an, as a bookseller, I understood the ramifications of that to small and independent presses and bookstores. And I worked for Amazon for 10, however many years. Mm -hmm. um, so, and you, you know, because I was in wholesaling too, I could see that from the wholesaling side as well, how difficult it was for the small presses to continue um, because they were having a hard time competing with some, so many of the large presses, but it was, that's the first time I'd ever heard it from that perspective of the agents not wanting to take on lesbian and gay publishers. Well, that was just, you know, and I didn't even work with that many agents because there isn't, there wasn't money in it for an agent. And right. in other words, if an agent, if an agent gets a percentage of an author's advance and as well as other money as it, as it comes in, and there aren't advances or there aren't large advances from small presses, then an agent has to do it purely out of love or you know, commitment to a particular author. They're just, it isn't commercially viable right. for them. So I had very, very few agented books and mostly that was um, a sort of a politeness relationship between an agent and an author, not because it was you know, a real business relationship that was going to make people some money. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it was very different. You know, I used to have discussions and I'm going to forget his name because that's what happens when you get close to 80. Um, uh, the guy, St. Martin's Press, gay book, Michael, gay book editor. Michael Denany. Michael Denany. We used Denny. to have these interesting discussions about the difference, the monetary difference of publishing for a trade house, his trade house in particular, because those were the figures that he you know, knew the best, and publishing in a small press and why books could be successful from a financial point of view for a small press and not be successful for a trade house. Because in order for it to be successful, it had to sell X number of copies. And the likelihood of some of the books selling that number of copies from a trade house wasn't going to happen. From a small press, it might very well happen because it was a very focused audience and there were bookstores and there were editors of publications. I mean, the object was to get the book out, out in, in the world. And then you had certain things that, that went and, you know, sort of took off on their own, like Stone Butch Blues, which had a life that was beyond the individual, the individual book. Um, and obviously Alison Bechtel, who went on to win major awards and get, you know, I mean, a class of, of her own, in, in a world of her own. So it, um, it was a very different world. And I was telling what was about to become a very tragic story. I closed Firebrand in 2000. Mm -hmm. precisely because of things that were happening both in the cultural political world 
in terms of what lesbians were reading or not reading or what they wanted to read or de a desire to become equal with everyone else, which meant in many ways to be like everybody else, okay? And the policies of the corporate publishing world and the large bookstores, the Barnes and Nobles of the world and what that did to the reality of selling books. So I'll, I've taken up space, that's it. <laughs> I, I wanted to just sort of echo here too that, that in, in one hand, uh, Outright talks about one, um, one particular time period and Nancy, your story um, maps on top of it, but the, the role of independent presses um, sort of rising and falling, discovering new voices um, does continue. Um, and there's in this this week's issue of The New Yorker or last week's issue, because I think the new one just came, there's another example of Topside Press, uh, which was started in 2010 or 2012 as a press to center trans voices and they published mm. Nevada by Imogene Binney, um, which was also, um, which is, is I think akin to the experience you had with Stone Butch Blues with Leslie um, in terms of it found an audience, it took off um, and now a major trade house has picked it up and, and done a reissue mm -hmm, of mm -hmm. it. So, mm -hmm. so this kind of dynamic between the press, between independent presses and commercial presses is persistent across a variety of I decades. Think, I, think, I, think that that's, I think that that's true. And it was very hard as, as someone who had given 15 years of my life to this institution, which I absolutely believed in. I mean, there was no, it, it was done for love and politics. It certainly was not done for money. Um, and for the, the belief in the voices of many of the women that I, that I published who made my life richer, not just from publishing, their, from reading their work, from being exposed to the things that they were writing about, which made my life much bigger, much bigger, gave me much more insight. It was hard to think of it as the kind of cycle that you're talking about, which I know is true. Right, which I know of course. Is true. Of course. So we have a great question from the uh, from from Carrie Johnson. Is there anything like an outright conference today? It, and then is there a current need for it? So Michael, do you want to um, jump in and offer some ideas about that? Sure. I, um, I, just before I do that, I want to say I want to go back to your original question about something that we remember. I going to say since I, I worked for the last six outright conferences tirelessly, I was exhausted. But my one clear memory is doing cocaine in my hotel room with Sarah Schulman. So then actually gets us to the Sarah Schulman story as well. And I'm I'm actually not adding Sarah about this because last time we did one of these things, she she's the one who, who brought it up. Uh, no, I think that right, I, I think that there are the Saints and Sinners conference in New Orleans. Um, I think Lambda Literary uh, does a lot of a lot of great things online. There's nothing like outright per the way outright was because we're, as Nancy's pointed out so beautifully, right? There's, we're in a totally different time period, right? I think it's important to realize that today there are lots, lots of gay, lesbian, and trans books getting published by trade presses. They're just not marketed as such. And what what we really right. saw back in the back in the '90s, right, was that of course the enormous amount of small small presses giving people like careers, wonderful careers, right? Um, but that, you know, the mainstream presses, whether it be, you know, St. Martin's or Dutton or other ones, were really, had really identified and created a market for identified gay and lesbian books. Um, and there are plenty coming out now, they're just not labeled as such. And what I think we gain with that, right, is a certain level of acceptance in mainstream culture, um, which, you know, I guess is better than no acceptance. <laughs> I've mixed about it, right? But what 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 we lose, right, is actually a an identified market, um, which I think was really really important back then. And Cheryl, are you calling on me, Michael? <laughs> How are you? Right, I'm back I in just, the classroom. Cheryl, your hand was. You look like you wanted to say something. <laughs> I do. I do. I do. I want to say something for the independent and small presses. Mm -hmm. And to say that uh, 
we still need them. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, that's what I wanted to say that we still need them. We still need their energy uh, because not all of us are going to be taken up by the major presses. Very few. Which, yeah, very few, which very is few. fine with me, you know. Um, why you laugh? No, it's fine with me, you know. And I, I think we need, we, because we need to maintain some control of our uh, literary production. Mm -hmm. right. That's and, all I wanted to say. And, and, and there are, I mean, I'm sure Julie knows much more than I do about lesbian presses, right? But there are gay male presses like Rattling, uh, rattling good, good, good Rattling Yarns Press. <laughs> Uh, which is publishing a great novel by uh, a a writer. He's a writer for Jerry Cabrera, who was who was actually part of Outright and part of Gay Community News. Uh, Rebel Satari, which is publishing a new series of um, poetry books from this from the nineteen seventies and eighties. Some of which mm. were gay poets books. Two two by my late lover Walter Borowski are coming out, plus some other ones. So there are there are small presses that are doing it. And you what know, in many ways, technically, I mean, according with the technology, it's, it's both easier to do it now, yeah. much easier, right? And easier yeah, with right. distribution, and at the same time, harder to actually convince people to buy them. Well, and one of the things that Mev Miller wrote in in a chat was, you know, that the that the the main thing that was lost, or one of the principal things, was a sense of community. Yes, it was. You know, there were. <laughs> There were the bars, this is from a lesbian perspective. There were the bars, there were the softball fields, right? And there was literary groups in bookstores. People would show up in droves for poetry readings, which, you know, as an English major in college many years before, that sort of totally blew me away. I couldn't imagine mm -hmm. that anybody would want to show up for a poetry reading in a way that looked like a fan group, okay? <laughs> But that was true. And, and that kind of stuff for a number of reasons, COVID not being one of them, um, you know, is very sad that there isn't, there isn't a sense of real community. This is as close to we get. No fault of yours, Julie, this is wonderful. Yeah. But it doesn't, you know, there isn't some other thing where everyone can go or many people can go and hang out with their peers or the people who they would like to have as, you know, mentors or readers or whatever. Yeah. Well, although I think that, I think that there are a number of really thriving literary communities and, um, and, you know, for the first time there's like new feminist bookstores that are being opened. Um, there's a feminist bookstore in Mississippi that that has been opened. There is a Burdock Book Collective is based in Birmingham, Alabama, and are doing both kind of like a bookmobile model, mm -hmm. but also producing events, um, mm -hmm. both within Birmingham, but um, a little more broadly, you know, exploring where else can they go in Alabama. Um, Karis Books and More is thriving. Um, sort of the election of um, he who shall not be named in 2016 really um, galvanized Karis as a heart of, um, of the South and of a feminist queer and trans South in a, mm. in a new formation that I think is really exciting. And longstanding bookstores have had changes in owners, um, including A Room of One's Own and Women and Children First in the Midwest. Um, and then also um, Elizabeth Nona said, of course, Cheryl um, is one of the leaders of the Hobart Festival of Women's Writers. Mm -hmm. um, which it has a vibrant community of writers and readers around it. Um, Sinister Wisdom also, when I started editing the journal in 2010, um, most people asked me like, well, who on earth is going to read this and why on earth would you spend your time doing it? 
Um, and suddenly we find, not suddenly, I mean, you know, 12 years later with an extraordinary amount of work, um, we have a growing subscriber base and, and new groups of people interested um, in, what we, in what we're doing. So I, I think that, that it's not what was during the 1980s and 1990s, but that groups of people are remaking spaces and communities and environments to serve what they need right now. Mm -hmm. Right, and I wanna say that I think that, that actually young people, by which I mean the, young, the only young people I know, my students, right? <laughs> that, that the impulse is there to write and publish. I teach a class at, at Harvard where it's engaged learning, so they have to do a public facing project. And last year, Cheryl came to the class, and last year, out of, out of, out of six fun. people, right, three people put on public poetry readings, and six people published poetry books, three of which were, in, were printed, the other ones were online, mm -hmm. right? So oh, it's not like, right. not like young people don't want to do this, they just have to be given yeah. the opportunity and maybe a little bit of funding and certainly some guidance encouragement but, but but they have voices that they want to put out there as part of a community i wanted to hop on briefly and, and point out a couple of things we usually end at eight this is going really wonderfully so we're going to stick around for a while longer um but if folks need to hop off right at eight we're not offended if you need to to move on with your evening um and i wanted to just to the point about uh, new feminist bookstores. We actually had a conversation last month uh, with the owner of All She Wrote in Boston, um, with the two people who are running Print Ain't Dead, which is um, a Black queer feminist mm. uh, book pop-up and project, and uh, both of them have been curating exhibits about the Kambahi River Collective and doing these really interesting Black feminist projects here in Boston. And the uh, historical influence on that work that we are, you know, here in, in Boston and Cambridge, there's such, uh, I think, deep connections to publishing, to GCN, to Outright, to new words, and to, I'm going to forget someone and I'm going to get in trouble, but, you know, Sojourner and Lavender Vision and so on and so forth. So, um, you know, I, to speak from the the younger perspective of these things, um, it's really important to hear from, from you all about all of the work that you've done and it is still making a difference now. So that's my piece, continue on. Thank you. Right, I mean, I, I think I would just add that, that I think people always wanna speak, well, people always wanna speak about themselves. <laughs> And need to be given permission to do that. People um, want to. I think that the, from a gay male perspective, in in Boston, Cambridge, in the seventies and eighties, right, we'd have monthly good gay poets open mic readings and get fifty people, mm. uh, mostly men who would then go out off. Well, either, as as Nancy pointed out, that lesbians had um, bars, softball teams, and readings. The men had bars readings and going off to the bushes later <laughs> or 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 to the bathrooms um <laughs> not as much fun as softball maybe um <laughs> well depending on who was there right but but the impulse is always there i think it's 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 a matter of 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 giving people telling people they, like one of my students said i you mean that i can write a book of poetry and get a publisher. Yes, he and he literally couldn't believe it. Right, it was like a dream he didn't know he had yet. <laughs> oh, oh thank right. You. Um, and you know, I think it's up to all of us to think of ways to, like, I mean, not just young people, but you know, writing groups, other groups, giving people spaces, whether it's online spaces or physical spaces, to know that they can be, that they have a voice, right? Um, I mean, what's the famous Muriel Ruckheiser line? Uh, if if every woman spoke her mind, the world the world would split open. <laughs> or told the truth about her life. I'm misquoting horribly, you know. And then just be able to tell people they can do it and and offer advice for us older people who have been doing this for a while. Right? Offer advice about how the best way to, to like do it.
I also want to add, I'm also always struck by, uh, when talking to people, by folks who helped raise money or gave money, often quietly, often anonymously, to help different formations and different things mm -hmm. happen. Mm -hmm. um, and in the case of the Outright book, you know, the first two conferences were in San Francisco. Um, the balance of the conferences were in Boston. Those were places where people could fundraise and find mm -hmm. um, people who would support uh, the project and um, give money to help make things happen. Uh, and I think I think sometimes um, that's often a role that I find myself playing, talking to people in in sort of helping think about like what kind of what kind of funding is realistic, what kind of work might make things happen, might might help to make things happen um, and make things more accessible to people. Are there any other um, good stories to share? And I, I, I have a pup barking. Um, my dog care for the for the hour apparently has expired. I'm going to step <laughs> out and my dog in for a moment uh, into the room that I'm in. Uh, but so someone should jump in with another good story from outright, either from our panel or from the audience. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I remember Michael. Yeah. I, I would just the one thing I'm uh, of all my in all my involvement with those years that I'm probably most proud of is actually when the one year and when after two more years we started a a um a, a separate distinct panels set of panels and spaces for gay youth. Right, uh, we, we, we worked with with some with some probably not at but high school teachers. And we had we had young people, uh, or all of them were high school age, uh, do uh, put their own panels together. Uh, we we invited them. We we actually created a special room for them that they could hang out and with with like one another. Um, and then there were some there were some people who thought it was a we were skirting danger with it, um, promoting homosexuality to young people, which we were. Um, but I I think it was something that was incredible for the mid 90s, given the political atmosphere. And that we should be doing now too. <laughs> Telling men not to sleep with men if they have more. Yeah, it's amazing how it's come back around, um, you know, slightly different language now with this idea of grooming children. Um, yeah. But it is exactly the same kind of rhetoric that existed in the 90s. Completely, yes. Mm -hmm. I also want to uh, echo some of that of young people as I recently had a conversation with a couple of young lesbians in the community where I live, 20, 20 nothing basically is how old they are. Um, and they were actually kind of pissed off that all of the things that the folks in my generation had with the bookstores and the festivals and the concerts and the sports teams and so all that community culture, that lesbian community activism is not available to them now. You know, that they, they're they lost. They don't know where to go. They don't know who to talk to. They, at least in the community where I live, there isn't a place or a space or that kind of organic sort of thing that was happening in the bookstores for them to go to. And they they want it and they want to talk, they, they, but they don't know how to get there. They don't know where to go. Um, and these two well, gals I was talking to. I just think they need off. to they need to do it. You well, know, yeah. it's like we're old. <laughs> they can they can ask us how to do it. You know, Absolutely. I mean, if they want it, they should do it. I mean, you know, come on. Yeah, I just I just want to jump in here as a uh, similarly of a of a younger generation of sorts, though certainly not twenty nothing, um, but uh, can't entirely relate to that uh, struggle any longer. Thank goodness. But um, I do think this is one of the important things about this book about outright 
about other books that have come out in recent years, thinking specifically of Sarah Schulman's uh, uh, book on uh, ACT UP. Um, I think these books, the, they're not just important because they're collections of these fantastic uh, speeches, but also because they offer a template, they offer a guide, mm -hmm. um, a roadmap for for those um, of a younger generation who have found, who are coming up and finding themselves without the same spaces, without the same community, without the same resources, like taking this material and making something of it and making something new and, and for ourselves. I mean, I think that's one of the ways that I got involved in this project with Julie is wanting to see, you know, just imagining what, um, how I could have benefited from having a conference like this um, at a critical time in my life and then wanting to, you know, figuring out a way to, you know, bring this project to life. And I think that's really what, that's the direction that's, we need to, I think young people need to feel empowered to be able to make these, to make the, mm -hmm. make these spaces for themselves now. Um, and as opposed to, but it's understandable as to why one wouldn't, uh, given everything that's kind of happening, why you could feel disheartened, but really taking these books and really taking, you know, everything that has been left behind and using it as the building blocks for something new. And I also think that we have to be careful about, you know, since this is a history gathering as well, about not telling a history that is um, too perfect and too sort of designed to make people um, feel like their present isn't good enough. Um, there were lots of there were lots of challenges, and there were um, there were things that that were unsettling. Um, about the past and, and in particular about outright. Um, I put into the link a, a beautiful essay that Eric Sneathan wrote um, about the outright conference and um, about this book. And one of the things he raised is, is the sort of quality of trans representation is, is modest in the book and of really um, interrogating ideas about the gender binary. Um, and I think he rightly sort of pointed that out as something that um, that we didn't deal with effectively as editors, uh, though we talked mm. about it a lot and we struggled with it. Um, and also something that that was um, not as central to the conference as it might be if the conference were happening today. Right. Um, and there's lots of other examples of um, of things that were painful and difficult. Um, when Essex Hemphill made his speech during the AIDS panel um, and did a critique of Robert Maplethorpe, he was booed. Uh, when mm. Linda Villarosa talked about, um, talked about the challenges that communities of color face and why they might be skeptical um, about gay and lesbian people as allies, she was booed quite loudly from the audience. Um, so there's there was friction and there was tension mm. um, as as a part of what was happening and that was also a part of what the kind of um, a, a part of the growth and development that individuals had through the conference that the community had um, but it was it shows that it's unfinished work. Mm. Yeah, certainly. I mean, being on the committee for Boston Fruit almost all those years, except the last one, right? The, the, the committee, because we were all sort of worked at GCN, we're a friend, all sort of had the same vision, but there were plenty of tensions with, with writers, plenty of tensions with, with other communities, plenty of people who, because we did have, we did have a very strong anti-racist commitment. And, and that it clearly, even as we expanded panels, it clearly meant that a bunch of, of white, writers who expected to be on panels every year could not be because he because even if you actually expand panels from five to seven and you add you know six more panels it's still not enough to bring everybody together and you know and this was really at, at times rather bitter um you know and i i think as as a program i think we made mostly the right decisions about things but i would do things differently now of course like I would do most of the 70s, 80s, and 90s differently. <laughs> <laughs> but you'd still do the cocaine. God, yes. uh, it was from New York and it was really good, yes. <laughs> Michael. Well, and I, you know, it, it, I mean, I think one of the reasons why another generation needs to do it, however they choose to do it and are able to do it so that it's not mirroring, it's just yep. 
what we did. It's so based know. upon their needs and whatever the technology means that things have changed. I mean, it was it was different. It was it was a different time. It was different understandings. It was less sophistication about certain kinds of things. It was, I mean, I'll give you an example. When we planned, when Leslie and I were talking about her going to Boston and doing various gigs, mm -hmm. she basically said to me, well, I don't, I, um, I wanna do this Socialists of America because that's my major political affiliation. And I said, but we always do the women's bookstore first. Okay, because that's sort of the political obligatory acknowledgement of how the community functions. And she said to me, I've tried going to that bookstore and they wouldn't let me in. Now, mm -hmm. I don't know the, the truth, the specifics, the circumstances of that, but I believe that, okay? And to me, I had never, I had never thought of that. That was my, I mean, that was my ignorance and lack of political sophistication, mm -hmm. okay? And so it's, you know, if I were doing it all over again, please God, no. But if I were doing it, if I were doing it all over again, I would be able to think about it much differently. And there's a lot of stuff that I just don't know, I'm not a part of. It's not where my life is focused at this particular point in my life, which is why I think young people have to do it and mm -hmm. they can get advice from or ask for what they need and see if it's, but, but it has to come. It's not just that they're young, that people are younger and have different kinds of energies. They have different kinds of political knowledge. They're living in a different time. And all of those things have to be brought to bear on getting people together. Well, we're living in it too with them. Yes, yes, but, yes, but, we're living in it, but I don't leave my house very much because I'll fall down in the street. So that's gonna happen. To, no, ser that's serious. Oh, Sarah. I believe not, you. Okay, I'm so what I'm you. saying is that that's where we're all moving. I mean, that is the inevitable place whether it's happening to me at 80, but it's not happening to somebody like my wife at 72, it'll happen to her too. I mean, it's just the nature of getting, of getting old. And so it, change, it just changes where one can focus one's, one's energies. It's not about mm. good or bad, it's about surviving on an individual, mm. on an individual level. Well, and we did it. You know, we did yes. it. Right. Right, we did. You don't have to do it anymore, even though you do it every year, Cheryl. I <laughs> Stop. <laughs> well, and there's a gift to leaving work that is imperfect and unfinished and, feel, and ready for uh, critique and disappointment so that people can be galvanized to do uh, new and different kinds of work. Well, and look at the times we live in. I mean, oh, I used to God. think it was bad then. It, it was. Being but a what? very generic. <laughs> yeah, well, it was in certain ways, but we now have, you know, all of the things that are happening, not to mention what Mother Nature is going to do to, you know, all of us, regardless of our political persuasion or, or, or personal identities. Yeah. Yeah. Um. You know, it's a lot going on. A lot, Nancy. Everybody. Well, I always like to, um, as because it seems like we're we're coming to a natural end for our conversation. I do like to challenge people listening to think about what gatherings of writers might look like at some point in the future. I think we're mm -hmm. we're coming in. We're probably we might not be there yet, but we're coming into a moment where there might be really um, fertile um, gatherings of people, especially as some of us are socially starved after the past couple of years. Mm -hmm. um, and I also like to. Say that Fire and Ink was another writer's formation that happened throughout the 2000s um, up until I, I think 2014. We reference it in the book, and I think and that was for African American LGBTQ writers. And I kind of have a sense that that there is a mantle there that could still be picked up. So I like to share that idea as much as possible. 
um, and as something that I think a new generation could come and pick up that conference. It did not happen on the regular, it was occasional. I think the next one would be Fire and Ink 6 or 7. Um, mm -hmm. that people could organize. Uh, and that that uh, there are lots of institutions today that could lend support to other organizing conference efforts. Mm -hmm. um, so That's I remain true. hopeful um, that there will be gatherings in our future. Joan, do you want to wrap up things? Sure. So first of all, <laughs> thank you all so much for your, uh, <laughs> your insight, your memories for this conversation. It's been really wonderful for me who never attended an outright uh, conference to hear about it and to hear from you. Um, and now I have a drug use story to share as a fun fact at a, a future event. And, um, <laughs> and I just wanna say thank you all so much for being here. Thank you for your work. Thank you for all of your work. Um, to the audience, thank you for being here with us tonight. As I mentioned in the beginning, the History Project is Boston's LGBTQ community archives. If you're interested in LGBTQ history in the Boston area, please check us out. Um, another thank you to Mass Humanities and uh, happy very end of Pride Month, everyone. I hope you have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Joan. Thank you. You too. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Talk to you soon, Cheryl. Bye-bye, my bye, bye. <laughs> bye. <laughs>